something last night as I've been digging. I've been doing a lot of digging. One thing leads to another. Have you ever noticed how when you get on the trail, one thing leads to another? And uh, I'm, when I started reading this, it's one of these things in your life, when you read it, it uh, you'll never forget it. All right? I'll never forget this. I'll never forget it because of the implications involved in it. First of all, it's the testimony of an honorable man. Admiral, he's an admiral. He's gone on now, but admiral. Uh, uh, Bird, Richard Bird. Here's the man who flew over the North Pole and was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. And I read the, the uh, statement uh, attached to that, how that he risked his life and so forth. He flew over the South Pole. That's not all he did though. After the war, he led a expedition to South America with over 4,000 troops and eight, nine, 10, 12 warships. And uh, it was called Operation High Jump. Never heard of it. But when you find out about one thing, it leads to another thing. Well, let's get into it quickly because you're wondering what's going on. The man's an aviator. He's a pilot. And uh, he leaves at 0600 hours. That's 6 o'clock in the morning for folks that, you know, if you're not familiar with the 24-hour clock. 0600 to 6 o'clock in the morning. He, he flies out and he's headed, uh, he headed north. He gives, his, he gives updates as to his flight, to turbulence that he gets in the air. He drops his altitude, raises his altitude, standard procedures of any pilot. And uh, he does this and he talks about how he does it and uh, continues to fly. He has, uh, he has constant radio checks with his base so they'll know where he is. They keep up with him. And uh, back in those days, they didn't have GPS and all that stuff. So uh, they flew by what's called dead reckoning a lot of times. And pilots know exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about dead reckoning. At, uh, at, uh, he, continues to, he continues to talk to them until he gets down, until he, until he comes, he's flying over the ice. He's flying over the North Pole. And what do you expect to see? Con nothing but ice. That's what you expect to see. One sheet of ice after another sheet, just solid white ice, snow, the North Pole. Until uh, he, uh, he sees a creature down below, which looks to him like a mammoth. And he drops his altitude to about 1,400 feet. And it is a mammoth. And uh, uh, this begins to really get his attention. Uh, he sees a mountain range. And in, uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, so now he's been in the air for four hours, he says he crosses over the small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best can be ascertained beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below, no green valley in, North, in, 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 Arctic, in the Arctic, no green valley. And uh, something is definitely wrong and abnormal here, he says. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side, port is left, starboard is right. To the port side are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigator, our navigation in instruments are still spinning. And the reason they're spinning is because he's approaching magnetic north. And, if you, and the magnetic pole, if you ever get around the magnetic pole, you, you forget your, 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 your magnetic compass. It's not going to work because the magnetism is so intense and, and, and the movement is so great that, you, that it's, it's no use to you. But in any event, he says uh, his, uh, his navigational instruments are spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. Then he sees this beneath and he says, at 1,400 feet, and I execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or some type of tight-knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible, he says, yet there it is. He decreases his altitude to a thousand feet and, take, and he takes binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed it is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Report this to base camp. At 10, uh, 10 30 hours, he encountered more rolling green hills. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. He's in the North Pole. Continuing on our heading now, navigation instruments seem normal now. I'm puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. And now what follows is one of the most incredible things I've ever read in my life. And let me put it in the context of this. When Satan showed the Lord Jesus Christ the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, he did just that. He has power. And uh, there are things going on that there is absolutely no physical definition or logical reasoning to, but the existence of it cannot be denied. And this is what's happening here. In 1130 hours, countryside below is more level and normal. If I may use that word ahead, we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. 
aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My God, he says, off our port and starboard wings, a strange type of aircraft. They're closing rapidly alongside. They're disc-shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They are close enough now to see the markings on them. It is a type of swastika. This is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We're caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. 11.35 hours, our radio crackles and a voice comes through in, uh, in what appears to, in English with what appears to be a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. The, the message is, welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral. You are in good hands. I note the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. Plain words, he's been taken over completely. Now, up to this point, you're going to say to yourself, well, this is a madman. Or you may say to yourself, I know the power of the devil. I know how he can deceive. And what follows, he is taken into a city by blonde haired men who look like these Aryans that Hitler and the rest of them were talking about in Germany. And then he's finally taken to their leader. And when, he take, when he's taken to their leader, uh, he has a conversation with him. He's their master. And that master tells him that essentially that they've been observing us on top of the earth where we live for a long time and that we have gotten to the point by killing each other and they're talking about the atomic bomb that had been just been recently dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki you know those two this happened 1940, uh, in 1947 I think this happened and they were saying that we are going to have to do something with the people who dwell on earth they tell Admiral Byrd that he's an honorable man and they ask and he asked him why am I here he, they said because you're chosen to be here you're a man that we can trust. We're going to tell you what's happening. We're going to tell you all of this. They tell him. They send him back. So he goes back and he tells his, his superiors. And uh, apparently they tell him to hush this up. This stays, this stays hush, hushed until right before he dies, this diary comes out. Because he says, I cannot leave this world without letting humanity know what has happened. I cannot leave. I must tell them what happened. Before we go any further, let's ask ourselves some questions. Number one, did he write this diary? Is this Admiral Byrd's diary? Did he, really, did he really write this? Number two, if he really did write this, and this is legitimate, this is his diary, then something obviously happened to this man when he was over the North Pole. Something happened, something obviously happened to this man. Number three, regardless of whatever happened to this man, he's convinced something happened to him, so it's, it's incumbent upon us what did happen to him when he was over the North Pole. All right. If you, press, if you press this thing a little further and do a little more studying into it, you'll find out that there's an awful lot of people out there that believe the earth is hollow. That it's not, it's not, uh, it's not a, it, there's not a molten mass in it like they say. Now, if you're a Bible believer, you know this. You know that the heart of this earth, hell, is located. If you believe the Bible, all right. If you believe the Bible. And if you believe the Bible, the book of Revelation makes it very plain that the bottomless pit, which is hell, was opened. And out of that pit came these creatures upon the earth. They're coming out on the earth. They're coming out on the face of the earth. Now that's a wild thing. This is why a lot of churches in this country, an awful lot of churches in this country, absolutely refuse to read or study the book of Revelation or preach from it because it has some things in it that just literally blow your mind. And that's one of them. Talking about creatures coming up out of the bottomless pit, Apollyon and the bad and all of that. But if I'm a, and I'm a Bible believer, I believe it's real. All right. You can get off and you can get way out in left field with a hollow earth theory, all right? And you can get in deep and all of this stuff that I'm just kind of going to, I'm just going to present it to you this morning in the context of what we're studying because we're studying, we're studying a, 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 uh, a deceit that's coming on this earth of unbelievable proportions, a deceit, all right, a deceit. Now, we know that Adolf Hitler Adolf Hitler, when he was Chancellor of Germany, was deep into the occult. We know they didn't do anything unless they consulted their occult masters and prognosticators and what have you. And that German, the German high command, Himmler and men like that, even Himmler himself was far more into the occult than Hitler. And Hitler was head over heels into it, but Himmler was deep into it. Uh, these men were guided every moment of their life by an, an occult satanic power and spirit. Germany... Germany did definitely develop during World War II some of the highest technology on the earth. I saw this the other day on the History Channel and I didn't know this. Nobody had ever told me this, but this is what the History Channel reported. That two German scientists in the 30s, in the 30s, these two German scientists had split the atom. Now think hard on that. 
think hard on that. And it was the German scientists, Werner, Werner von Braun, men like that, who got America into space. That's a fact, folks. That's a fact. No question about that. The only reason they didn't put them to death at Nuremberg with the trials was because they needed them. And so they, they needed their technology, what happened. Anyway, Germany uh, apparently was, was, was way ahead of the rest of the world in some of this technology. Germany had a society called the Vril Society, V-R-I-L. How many have ever heard that term? Most people haven't, but a few of you have, all right? That's, a, that's, a, that's an occult society. But the premise of the Vril Society was this. They were able to tap into satanic power and apply it to physical things. See? They were able to tap into satanic, to occult power. They called it, a, they called it, what a force they called it. We know what it is. The power is either of God or the devil. But they tapped into it. And they were able to apply it to physical things. There are photographs of flying saucers the Germans made. I've seen them. But they're not flying saucers like, like you know, the classic example of them. But they are flying saucers. In other words, they are propelled by a propulsion, si propulsion system that was unknown by most of the world at that time. But in any event, the bottom line is that the Germans had tapped into the occult world and had begun to, to, uh, to, to build this system based on what they were getting from the occult world. And that system was, was this. They believed that in the north, in the north, they believed in the north, that there was an entrance into a hollow earth and that spirit beings lived there that were vastly superior to us. And that these spirit beings were our forefathers. And that's what we, he, Hitler was trying to do was to try to bring the race back, the Aryan race back to its roots, back to what it should be. And this is why the root race theory is so important when you get into this stuff. You remember I told you about the root race? You remember what, race, what which one I told you the Aryan was? There's seven of them. Five, exactly. Five. It's number five. It's the fifth. And this root race theory, the Theosophists taught it. Blavatsky in Russia taught it. All of this, all of this evolutionary, spiritual evolutionary that brings this super race, this super identity. These people believe that. The evolution, when you talk about biological evolution, all right, you're talking about what they teach at UT and all the major colleges in the world. They teach biological evolution. What is biological evolution? That's what Charles Darwin taught, right? All right, that's simple enough on the surface of it for people to relate to. Biological evolution. I don't believe it, but they, that's what they teach. All right. Then there is social evolution. All right. Political correctness is a product of social evolution. What's social evolution? Well, if biological evolution is true, then social evolution is where the is where the masses and humanity and governments are able to uh, learn how to live uh, live in live in peace and blah blah and so forth. In plain words, social evolution means that there must be a one world government for men to live. That's social evolution. See, that's not biological evolution, but the idea is that if evolution is true, they believe it is, then therefore there that, that justifies the idea. Well, men men must live together. Then there is then there is this esoteric, this spiritual, this. This stuff here we're talking about that Admiral Byrd saw, there is that type of evolution. And this gets into the very, this gets into the mystical category of it. Because this gets into that high brow stuff about the spirit beings that are channelers and guides and are communicating with people. And the U.S. government would never tell you this, but they've had all kinds of experiments into this. And they've got labs and they've got an underground labs and they're doing experimentation into this stuff. And, they're, and, and, and all of this is going on right now and people go off on the deep end when they get into it and you got to be awful careful with it because you can get into this stuff and you can become possessed by these spirits because these are demons and these demons are smart admiral bird saw something i don't doubt that for a minute but he did not see a civilization of advanced beings that had evolved to that point what he saw was either an apparition or a physical manifestation of some spirit power that's demonic that's what he saw but it blows my mind to begin to realize how powerful it is. What I'm going to say to you this morning, I want, to say, I want to say it to you, and I want you to take it to heart. When the deception comes, if you're not a born-again believer, you'll be swept away with it. The deception will be greater than you ever imagined in your life. It is going to be profound as to what happens. When Ted Gunderson talked about, and I put it together, he talked about people in the high places are Satanist. What he's talking about, they're Illuminati. He's talking about spiritual power in high places that will bring about a one world government. And by doing that, they intend to rule the world. And they have the help of a whole 
I don't know what you, what do you call it, a, a mass of demonic spirits who are able to perform all kinds of miracles, deceptive miracles, manifestations, and all of this stuff to help them to bring about that one world government. And the goal is so that they can put one man up and worship him as God, the Antichrist. Now, there is a mind behind all of it. There's a mind directing it, and that mind is the devil, Lucifer. He wants worship. He wants worship. He, he, he covets worship. He does. And money's nothing to him. And the souls of men. And power's nothing to him. He's got power. He covets worship. That's why he said to the Lord Jesus Christ, you fall down and worship me, and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. He covets it. Now, now when you look around yourself, and I'm, what I'm talking about, you know, I've, I've talked about bird, and I've talked about this other stuff. You've got to ask yourself the question, well, how long is it going to be then? I mean, they've got all this technology. They've got all this stuff going. How long is it going to be before they bring this together and they do it? They're already doing it. It's already happening. It's already happening. When you look outside, how many of you have noticed these little antennas that, are, that have a square box on top of them? That's ELF. That's an ELF antenna. You know what that's for? Ostensibly, it's for this. Send frequencies into your head. And you wonder, why Why is it that I, I'm thirsty? Or why would I like to have an ice cream? Or why? You know, all of a sudden, this desire hits you. It's because they're feeding this stuff into your brain. Now, you say, well, now, that's crazy, preacher. You know, that, they wouldn't do that. The government wouldn't do that. Would they? digging I've been doing a lot of digging one thing leads to another have you ever noticed how when you get on the trail one thing leads to another and uh, I'm when I started reading this it's one of these things in your life when you read it it uh, you'll never forget it all right I'll never forget this I'll never forget it because of the implications involved in it first of all it's the testimony of an honorable man Admiral he's an admiral he's gone on now but Admiral uh, uh, Bird Richard Bird here's the man who flew over the North Pole and was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. And I read the, the uh, statement uh, attached to that, how that he risked his life and so forth. He flew over the South Pole. That's not all he did though. After the war, he led a expedition to South America with over 4,000 troops and eight, nine, 10, 12 warships. And uh, it was called Operation High Jump. Never heard of it. But when you find out about one thing, it leads to another thing. Well, let's get into it quickly because you're wondering what's going on. The man's an aviator. He's a pilot. And uh, he leaves at 0600 hours. That's 6 o'clock in the morning for folks that, you know, if you're not familiar with the 24-hour clock. 0600 is 6 o'clock in the morning. He, he flies out and he's headed, uh, he headed north. He gives, his, he gives updates as to his flight, to turbulence that he gets in the air. He drops his altitude, raises his altitude, standard procedures of any pilot. And uh, he does this and he talks about how he does it and uh, continues to fly. He has, uh, he has constant radio checks with his base so they'll know where he is. They keep up with him. And uh, back in those days, they didn't have GPS and all of that stuff. So uh, they flew by what's called dead reckoning a lot of times. And pilots know exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about dead reckoning. At, uh, at, uh, he continues to he continues to talk to them until he gets down until he until he comes he's flying over the ice he's flying over the North Pole and what do you expect to see Con nothing but ice that's what you expect to see one. Sh